me, please. <laughs> Wake up. Okay, uh, two more good talks to go, and then a big keynote, and then everyone can go party. Um, okay, uh, we have Imran with us this afternoon, talking. Hi, everyone. Yeah, about security stuff and making microservices secure and making your DevOps secure, which should be awesome because my current version of securing my microservices is useless. Obscure URL, which is not very secure. Uh, so yeah, everyone's got a seasoned security professional with eight years of experience uh, doing all kinds of stuff, helping uh, folks in R&D, consulting, product-based industries, uh, has a passion for solving complex security problems. Um, he's very active in the local community. Uh, founder of Null Singapore, which I've never heard of, but I'm now going to go and find out about, which is yeah, the biggest infosec community here in Singapore. Um, so he's experienced at all of this big event stuff, more than me even. Uh, he's also the author of DevSecOps Studio and Awesome Fuzzing Projects, uh, which I'm sure you can give us a little intro about. Okay. So yeah, give him a warm welcome. Yeah. And Thank you. you. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, am I audible there at the end? Guys, there? Okay, cool. How about here? Awesome. Now, before we get started, let's uh, do a quick survey. How many of you are from a security background here? Are in security? Okay, none, zero. So I'll keep it very dry, okay, very basic from that, that front. Uh, how about uh, DevOps? Okay, handful of you. How about Devs? Oh, I wonder what what you are, the rest of you guys, like, okay, never mind. Uh, designers, probably? No? Managers? Okay. We'll assume that, yeah. Great, so you already gave, me, uh, gave the introduction, so I'm not going to repeat the whole slide again. So today we are going to discuss what Agile and DevOps uh, is all about, and why we started using those terms, or what, what's, what, what it is all about. And then we'll look into microservices, what they are, how they benefit us as an organization or as an individual. And then finally, we'll, we'll look at uh, something called DevSecOps maturity model, where you can go ahead in your organization and embed security as part of your CI CD pipeline or DevOps pipeline. Right? Sounds interesting? OK. No excitement, I guess. <laughs> Come on, we just had tea. One more again. Sounds interesting? Yeah. Yeah, that's more like it. OK. So let's start. Uh, little introduction about agile devops and microservices what they are uh, and you know what's it all about okay so now as like any presentation which starts with a story right so long long time ago and singaporeans tell me what it is afterwards okay and then so we started off right long long ago which is not a, not long ago was that we used to develop applications in a very traditional sdlc model where we start off with uh, requirement phase, then we design an application, and then we implement the design to fit, uh, you know, to, to um, implement the business requirements. And then finally, once we are happy with it, we used to go deploy it and maintain it like for ages. Correct? So these are traditional SDLC. How many of you are Okay, none of you. Pretty interesting. Good bunch. Okay. And then, so with the with secure sdlc we had one problem the biggest problem w what is it can someone summarize that freaking slow freaking slow right anyone else anyone from here what was the problem with traditional secure sdlc right again so what he said so i call this a wall of slowness like what business wanted developers never used to Coded because the business always used to change the requirements, and it was difficult for, to keep keep track of it. Let's say, and if, let's say, if, uh, if a business uh, or product manager comes to you and say that, hey, you need to rewrite the entire application and make it like awesome, DevOpsy, and you'll go, okay, and you have about one week to do it, and then, it'll, oops, dude, you need to change the entire architecture to make it work. It's not going to happen even like if you give me a one year, right? So those were kind of a requirement. So there was a huge gap between business and the, and the development team, and usually that led to a, a projects running over budget, over time, and, all, and over all the wrong things you can think of for a project, right? 
Now imagine a software engineer building a building, right? You wouldn't want to sit inside that building, right? Because you you don't you never know it's tested or you know he did it in a hurry or something like that. Okay, and then to tackle this problem, we uh, have something called agile, right? Which happened when we, it says that you ne you're never going to freeze your requirements. Rather, you're going to iterate it or weekly or monthly or a, uh, you know quarterly basis. And then you make every time you develop something, you're going to go and show it to the business guy, saying that hey, does it look good to you? If yes, we move forward. Otherwise, we don't develop it, right? So that's what the agile uh, solved. Now this is this is between just developers and the business guys, right? Product manager and uh, development uh, folks. Now, because of agile, they became like you know superheroes. They could now push it to production every seven seconds. Imagine that, right? Facebook and Microsoft they push to production every sec uh, seven seconds, and some of them push to production on their day one. Imagine you just join a company and you're pushing to production on day one. Can you even imagine that uh, if you're coming from a traditional SDLC background? Yeah, you don't understand the architecture. You don't understand the design of a functionality, but yet you could push it to production on day one. right? Keep that in uh, back of your mind. We'll come back to that point afterward. But, and then because now the developers are superheroes, they are deploying to production super fast. Uh, we had a problem with ops now. Like ops are now, and the developers started complaining that ops are damn slow. Oh, right. We want to do something better, and that's where we started working on something called DevOps. Instead of only ops managing the, the production environment or staging environment, it's now the responsibility of both the developers and ops to deploy to production and maintain it. And if you look at the unicorns in this space, uh, both Amazon and Netflix. If you, the team which creates the code, which you know implements the code, also runs it on the production. Okay, there's no ops guy for you, for your information in between. Ops is there as a center of excellence, and they'll help you do the right things, but they are not involved in your day-to-day -day activities. Rather, you as a developer are pushing to production, are maintaining the uh, production environment, and this this led to a drastic increase in uh, productivity because. There's no disconnect between, hey, you know, a developer saying, hey, it, it works on my system. Why it's why you are not able to operations? Why you are not able to deploy to production? Right. So there was always this uh, confusion between both ops and uh, de you know devs. That is what uh, we call wall of confusion, right? And to solve that, of course, we had uh, DevOps. So what it does is it brings devs and ops together in a uh, in a organization and they try to solve problems together as a whole rather than uh, sitting in their own silos and not collaborating with each other okay now this is how your typical devops pipeline or workflow would look like you you first plan and then you create and then you verify once you're happy with it you package and release it right and finally someone would configure it and uh, continuously monitor it deploy and monitor it right so we have right now uh, we, so what we did was we overcome two walls, right? What was the wall one? Wall of slowness. And the wall two was wall of confusion. So now we are happy with business guys. We are happy with developers. We are happy with ops, right? Who else are we missing? Right? Security. Correct? And two guys work together very nicely. Uh, I have a very classic uh, video from uh, of Singapore. How many of you are from Singapore here? Okay, yeah, you guys will understand it. And those who are our guests, please watch and enjoy this uh, comedy show. My friend want to buy this computer, uh, because he want to play in 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 ah Indian net, ah Indian net, ah Indian net, ah. Ah, yeah. I said you don't understand. Okay. How many money? How many money? How many dollars? How many dollars? How much is it? 
Okay, so that's your ops, security, and devs talking with each other. And they didn't have any, uh, you know, they never agreed with each other of what they want, right? Uh, the guy who's behaving as a mediator, probably in a place like ops, where it's difficult to handle both the devs and ops, like, ah, uh, he's, he's like, you know, uh, strained about, uh, stressed about it. Okay, so that's how a traditional relationship between ops and dev and security was uh, like, right? And that's what I call a wall of compliance, right? Like usually security comes at the, at the last, right? When, before you go to deployment. And usually what happens is that you either save, uh, see him like this, like a very uh, angry and young guy, or you, you look at like a very smart guy or whatever. If people. And then people have different notions about what a security team looks like, right? How many of you had good experience with security guys? Right? Okay, so I, I don't have even one hand up, okay? Which is very bad as a security, sorry, sorry. Okay, and then and the reason for that was predominantly, again, because of secure as DLC, right? So the way we behave, uh, the way, way we work, DLC. And in order to fix that, we, uh, and and. And problem is also because devs to ops to security ratio is about 100 to 10 to 1. So no matter what we do, it's never going to scale, right? So we have to do a, a better job of implementing, and that's why that's why we have to now embed security as part of uh, SDLC. That is where the terms like secure DevOps or uh, you know security DevOps comes into play, right? And the way and it will provide a lot of benefits. I'll just skip over. You, you guys must be knowing all of this. It will help you deploy to productions faster, and it will also help you fix bugs faster, right? Security bugs. And then it provides you a lot of flexibility. Like you could say, hey, you know what? If I have this vulnerability, I don't want to fix it. I want to accept it. It provides that flexibility as well. And then it provides you reliability. Like if something goes wrong, you can quickly fix it and deploy it to as uh, production as soon as possible. And all of th this to are put together using automation. And you can embed this, you know, you can embed security or uh, into DevOps pipeline uh, if you have these things working, right? If none of, if even one of them is not working properly, then your security would fall through, okay? So you need to have a culture of security where security should be everyone's responsibility, and then that will lead you, lead to a good uh, quality product, right? And you also should have automation like CI, CD built into it, um, and, and it should be, you know, continuously deployable and con uh, at least continuously uh, deliverable, right? And then, when you're working with each other, you should be willing to share knowledge with each other and 
and you know look at the priorities not have competing priorities but rather hey what are your concerns for this particular deploy if you have any i will help you fix those kind of a thing okay and then in order to all of this you have to measure it so if you cannot measure it you cannot improve it right so in short we have to build bridges not walls okay if i if i have to put it uh, in a nicer way we have to build guard rails not gates meaning that no one should be policing you saying that hey if you pass this then only i will let you go to production okay okay with that said i will leave this uh, slide here for a while now before we move on how many of you know here what microservice is all about microservices know what microservices okay so only 3 of you or 5 ago okay about 6 people so i will introduce you what microservices and how it benefits you or uh, you are as an individual and organization and then um, we'll look into it uh, what it is okay in order for web microservices to be working or helping your organization you need to have at least continuous integration and deployment uh, figured it out if you can't do it then it's not going to provide you benefits okay at least you need to have ci cd automated process in place so that you can quickly deploy to production okay so this is how a typical ci cd pipeline would look like where i would not talk about continuous integration because all of you are from development most of you are from development background so you all know okay when it comes to the difference between delivery and uh, deployment is simple in delivery you have a uh, you know manual process someone saying like a buddy one of your buddies saying that yes it's it's good to go to production whereas in deployment uh, no there is no human intervention at all it goes directly as soon as you make a commit it goes to production and there are different ways to do it uh, you can have a feature branching you have a you know trunk based branching it depends uh, based on your organization but suffice to say that there is a way to get your code from your machine to production automatically okay fair enough now this is like one of the primary requirements for that if you have this then let's talk about microservices right so microservices is basically an architectural style wherein instead of creating a one big monolithic application you you would be separating your application into smaller chunks piece by piece by piece okay so if you have uh, uh, and these are some of the benefits it provides like why people are like gaga about microservices these days right there everyone is talking about microservice i want to be microservice i want to do devops the reason for that is pretty simple so if you have microservices you can scale your application vertically as as much as you want based you know based on your growth organization growth or based on your traffic uh, your your applications traffic so you can just scale it horizontally you you can scale as many times as you want as many machines uh, you know cpu ram you can just scale it uh, vertically problem with uh, monolithic application was you couldn't you could only scale horizontally not vertically meaning that you could just add more and more machines uh, and uh, bigger bigger machines basically but there is a limit to you know how big a machine could be maybe you can go up to like a 120 gigs of ram uh, but uh, maybe after that you would hit a limit you know uh, physical limit of how much uh, scale, how much vert horizontally you can scale okay so that's one of the benefit it provides and because microservice is just doing one job and it's doing very uh, doing it very very well think it like a, a linux commands right you can have a cat you know, cat you can combine cat or grep and then uh, wc commands together to do something uh, bigger job or you can combine cat and find or you know rm together to do something big so microservices follow similar methodology where you divide your big monolithic application into a smaller chunks and uh, you know we can talk about how you can divide them like based on the domain or based on the functionality of that there are different approaches to it we, we can talk about it but i'll keep it very brief okay so you divide and, and uh, keep it into smaller chunks once you do that because it's just a smaller piece of a bigger puzzle you can deploy it separately and pretty fast as well okay uh, and how smaller should be a microservice some people say um, your microservice should be you can rewrite that entire microservice in like two weeks or some people say you should have like a one pizza or two pizza team uh, the team who is handling the microservice mm, you know should be able to feed itself in like a one or two pizzas okay 
yeah, and then they are efficient because they are smaller, and then you can deploy them, scale them uh, very fastly, and you can you know push it to production faster as well. So they're efficient and flexible, unlike uh, and, and and you know uh, the way this is handled is usually like a container technology like Docker or you know LXCs, and then. Because they are very smaller and you can change them like within two weeks, rewrite that entire thing within two weeks, they help you innovate faster. They help you deploy, go to the market faster. Right? So that's why people are like uh, crazy about this. Now this is a typical diagram of how a monolith look like. Business logic, a data access layer, all put together in a one big box. Okay? We do of course have MVC architecture, but they are still used as a, uh, a big blob of uh, you know code and then you will uh, of course have one and a load balance back and so it will be only one database as a whole whereas when it comes to microservices every functionality every micro So that will help you scale as many times as you want, uh, and then it will provide all the and left hand side.
this is all fair and good and uh, you know bad about microservices but because developers are pushing code to uh, deployment uh, to production faster security also has to scale right i talked about wall of compliance where security is not moving faster so because of the nature of microservice it becomes very very easy to secure as well because now instead of scanning the whole code base which might take like 10 days you can now scan that microservice just the microservice which can which we can finish in like 10 minutes or 15 minutes it's pretty it becomes very easy and instead of testing the whole application as a whole you can concentrate on uh, one part of uh, the important part of your microservice right that will also help you in terms of scaling so these are some of the uh, you know benefits of it and the way you should approach is basically is that you try to embed security as early as possible in the DevOps cycle or CI CD cycle. And I'll show you a demo in a couple of minutes of how you can do it pretty easily, right? So embed security as part of uh, SDLC. Uh, so if you look at a typical DevOps pipeline, the the below ones are you know, your functional requirements, code branching, for CI server you compile, you do a integration test, unit tests, and then finally you do performance security testing and then configuration management, provisioning, metrics, and monitoring. That's, that's how your typical uh, you know, DevOps pipeline look like. But in each of these stages, we can embed security from the beginning. Okay? So if you look at this slide, you can see that in, in code, we can uh, make sure that our, uh, we are not pushing secrets to our you know, uh, version control system, like GitHub or Bitbucket. Correct? And then we can also scan for dependencies, meaning if you, if you are using third-party vulnerability components. So you can scan for that. In build process, you can do a security unit testing. You can scan Docker for vulnerabilities if you're using Docker, of course. Uh, and then you can also do static analysis or linting, uh, security part of linting. And then finally, in the, uh, in the test phase, you can also test it dynamically using something called Zapbox. So I'll show a demo of all of these. And then you can test for how good your SSL set, uh, settings are. And then you can automatically harden your systems as well, okay? So using something like golden images, or uh, you know, you know. And then finally, you can also automate compliance now, okay? It, now we live in a very interesting era where um, it was never possible to automate compliance in a very, um, you know, uh, in in a reliable manner. But now we have a technology and a means to automate compliance as well. And then you should finally. Monitor. So I'll show you a demo of uh, each of them, like how we can accomplish that uh, in uh, DevOps pipeline, and thereby scaling your security, improving security from from the beginning. Okay. So that's one way of doing it, right? We talked about shift security left, meaning put your security in the beginning of a pipeline rather than at the deployment phase or the maintenance phase. Okay. So that's a point one. Second is uh, you should make security self-service. Because uh, as you can see uh, before, that ratio to dev and security is 100 is to 1. So we, we, you will not, you will never have enough security guys. So you have to scale. And then security is also expensive. Okay. So if you could do even 50% of uh, security in CI/CD, you could save at least uh, a lot of money. Okay. And then bring security professionals to do their job. Uh, you know, which is like a uh, so you capture the low-hanging fruits and let the professionals handle the rest. Okay, so try to create you know self-service platforms, embed security into CI/CD. That will also give visibility uh, for developers and operations to do security properly. Uh, so that's the, that's another technique. And then another one is like each team, each each one of your Scrum teams can have one person who might spend probably eight hours in a quarter doing security tasks, just some automation, some. Uh, looking at from a security perspective and eight hours in a quarter is not a lot to us if, if you look at it just one hour uh, one day in a quarter right so you can using that one hour day you can drastically improve uh, your security question okay so th uh, these are some of our security champions so we went to <coughs> DevSecOn as part of it and you can see literally like uh, we usual security ships left okay <laughs> So yeah, so you try to put security in and uh, work with the developers and you look at all developers and ops are happy even there is a security guy, even if there is a security guy. That's where we should want, where we want to go, okay? Now, another thing you can do, the point three is put, try to keep everything as a code. 
So now you could do compliance as code and security as code as well with something like Ansible or Inspect, which we will see in a minute, right? So there, there are technical solutions available. You just have to apply them. And they're not hard to implement, to be very honest. It's just that we don't know, OK? OK, moving by that. And then the fourth biggest thing you could do to improve security posture of your microservice is please, please, please use frameworks and tools which are secure by default. Right? For example, Ruby on Rails is secure by default. Django is secure by default. Try to use those frameworks which have good security record to build your applications on. Of course, microservice, you might be not using Django. It's pretty heavyweight. You might be using Flask. But do pay attention like how Django has implemented that functionality and use it to implement your microservice. Okay? So there are a lot of things we can learn from existing solutions and bring it in your microservice as well. With that said, this is all good enough. This is what you have to do. Now we'll talk about how we are going to do it. Okay? And the way we will do is using uh, something called DevSecOps uh, maturity model, where what we do is we do static analysis and dynamic analysis. Static meaning, uh, and then uh, we have like about four levels in this, but I will only talk about two because of the time constraints. Level one is that you, you implement uh, SaaS tools, like Bandit is for Python, linting and all those things so you will run them as it is without making any changes okay and then you run dynamic uh, tools like zap proxy verb proxy these are security tools which run on your running code okay sas is like your code is not running yet it's like a build stage of uh, your stuff stage two you run the same static tools but you add rules to it you you add some intelligence into it okay uh, both for static analysis and dynamic analysis so and by doing some minor tweaks, and again, these are not hard to do. You can easily do it. Uh, static analysis, uh, simply, uh, you are not running your code yet. It's just as a code, you know, as a text. So you run test when the code is in like in text format. This is called static analysis. You also have something called dynamic analysis, which means that you have provision a server, like a staging server or deployment uh, production server, and you you then run test on it. Okay, that's that's called dynamic analysis. And to do this, uh, we have different tools. We'll, we'll talk <laughs> slightly about it. And because I saw many developers uh, you know, worried about security of microservice or security of their entire stack, I created a platform called DevSecOps uh, Studio. Okay? So what it does is it, it simulates entire DevOps pipeline in, virtual, in, in a virtual machine. So you can download it and play with it. Uh, uh, locally as well. Okay? It's open source, of course. It's easy to set up. It's just one command. Back rent up, and it puts up everything. And it is, again, uh, infrastructure as code, uh, config, config, using Ansible as a configuration management system. So the demo which I'm going to show you now will have uh, these uh, five systems in it. right? So you have a developer machine, and then you have, there's a Git server. I'm using GitLab because it's open source. I can show it uh, live now. And then they, uh, you have also have a CI CD pipeline. And then finally, you have something called runner. It's like if you use Jenkins, it's something like Jenkins slave. OK, a runner is just a slave. And then finally, you have a production server. And if you're using Jenkins, you could do that, something like this. You replace CI CD with Jenkins and slave with Jenkins slave. Or if you fancy SaaS solutions, then uh, you can use GitHub. You can use Travis CI or Circle CI. And then you know Docker's registry to deploy into EC2. Okay, so you can do however you want, but we are going to simulate this uh, setup now. Okay, so with that said, what we'll do is since we are in PyCon, which is amazing. Yes. 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 Okay, that's more like it. We're going to talk about Python tools. So SAS, we have a, a tool called Bandit, which lets you do static analysis on Python code. You have a Zap proxy, which is platform agnostic. It doesn't matter which language you're using. And then for hardening, we'll use Ansible uh, to make sure we are compliant with some compliances. We'll use something called inspect. Spelling is wrong. There's no T at the back. And then to see if developers are not pushing secrets to production, we'll use something called Truffle Hog. It looks at your code and see if you have pushed uh, you know, your AWS key or you know, some tokens in your code. OK. Anyone has done that before? Pushing secrets to code? I see a few nods. OK. We shouldn't be doing it. So what I have here is uh, okay. So what I have here is uh, a typical GitLab CI uh, dot YAML file. This is something like Travis Travis dot YAML, Circle CI dot YAML, uh, Jenkins file for pipeline Jenkins pipeline. 
And here what, what we are doing is we are creating, okay, you know what, I will show you pictorially. Let's do this. Okay, so this is our pipeline now. So what we are doing is we are scanning for Git secrets and then we are linting it from both from security perspective and uh, development perspective and then we are doing static analysis. Once we are happy with it, we are, we are doing SSL scan on it and then finally we are releasing it to production. If, if all stages go good, if nothing fails in between, we are releasing that software to production. If the tests are failing, then we will not release to production. And you can configure it however you want. Right? You can say only fail the build if high severities are like 10 or you know, whatever. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. So I have about like uh, five stages here, build, testing, release, integration, testing, and then deploy. On stage one, like which is like a maturity level one, what I'm doing is uh, I'm pulling a linter called Hardalint for Docker. I'm linting it, linting with it, okay? If you go look at the linting part of it, uh, okay, so as, and this will trigger every time I make any change. Any code change happens, the build triggers. And if you find an issue, you, you will not deploy to production. If, if everything is good, you deploy to production, okay? Uh, and just to show you that I'm not bluffing, this is running, uh, and you can see that uh, this ran about like 38 minutes ago before I started the presentation, so it, 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 it's live. I can also show you, uh, hold on, let me show you then. This is running, okay. Edit. Okay, so I'll just add, uh, Echo zero, okay. I, I'm adding something. I'm coming to changes. Okay, now let's see the pipeline running. Okay, pipeline should start because I made a modification in the code. Okay, as you can see, the pipeline is running. It just started, and uh, my SaaS job is running at the moment. I uh, will will let it run. Meanwhile, let's go and look at the other ones like static analysis we ran static job and we are using something called bandit here as you can see uh, so i'm downloading a docker container which i have written called ban can you see the screen okay fair enough so i think yeah so we are downloading um yeah bandit docker container and then we are scanning the code with the container the bandit program okay if you look at the program once it finishes the scan it says hey Dude, I found a vulnerability which is a high severity and with high confidence. I have high confidence that this is an issue. And then it will tell you exactly what's the issue. Here we are running OS commands which usually lead to security vulnerabilities. And then you also have another uh, medium kind of issue where you are running untrusted SQL queries. Like, you know, appended, uh, prepared, not prepared statement, but uh, concatenated statement. So it's, it's, it's complaining about that. And then you also we are also scanning for git secrets to make sure that there are no secrets in our code as you can see it finished in a minute ago so i was not bluffing really uh, and then you can go look at the code and it, it did find out some secrets in it as and i have hard coded a secret which is django's secret token which is there which lives in your settings.py uh, so that's there okay so it, it will find out that hey, there is a you know security issue with your code, you need to uh, rotate it and whatnot. So you'll find if someone pushes secrets to your uh, code. And once we are happy with it, uh, we can do a linting, so I'll skip that, and then I'll show you a uh, OST. What we are doing here is we are looking for vulnerable third-party components, right? Like the OpenSSL component, OpenSSL, or Django application as such. So, what I did is, you can see I ran a tool called safety, uh, and it's pretty simple as well. You see here, there's just two commands, safety, and what I'm doing here is pip install safety, and then this command checks for it. Like I'm giving it a requirements file, hey, check for these things to make sure there are no vulnerabilities in it. And if you look at this, you will see that it did find out that I'm using uh, Django 1.8.3, the latest is two, and it is vulnerable to some attack, okay? So it figured it out. So I think, yeah. So that's the, this is how you could uh, do all of the stages and in, that includes SSL as well. You can see I did a SSL scan, it, it let me look at what cipher am I using, am I vulnerable or not. If I'm vulnerable, it will fail the bill. 
Okay, so as you can see, it's pretty easy. Usually, two command, just two liner commands, and it'll help you improve your security. I think with that, um, I am done with my presentation. Any questions? I can take one question. Yeah. How does Ansible play in this? Uh, you can, you know, just embed as part of CI/CD. Uh, if you are interested, I'll show you a demo here. Uh, of how I can, yeah, so I have a playbook here which hardens a Ubuntu machine, okay? So I run this and it will harden my production environment uh, with all the necessary uh, patches and all. You can see it's hardening uh, for a lot of stuff. It's, it's securing my infrastructure, making sure it's compliant to any compliance which I have to be compliant with, okay? Okay, a any okay. other? I think with that I'm done. Thank you yeah. for your time. Uh, uh, please Thank you very do. much, Imran. Unfortunately,